mean, I, I talked about this one yesterday, and it went in a completely different direction. I even wrote something up on the board to remind myself to go in a certain direction, and I did not go in that direction because the class went someplace else. But what he's talking about here largely is this idea of living an authentic life. Of living an authentic life. And what I mean by that is, well, to know who you are. Far, far easier said than done. Um, Kai and Leilani both hit on this idea of when you have like something physical in front of you, you know that it's gone. Um, I lost one of my earbuds. I'm sorry, one of my AirPods, sorry. I lost one of my AirPods. Um, I noticed I lost it because I opened my case and there was only one in there. There wasn't two in there. I'm sorry, there weren't two in there. That's how I noticed it. When you lose five dollars, how do you notice it? Because you go in your pocket and suddenly it's not there. And then you can maybe really feel it if you notice that you're missing your five dollars when you're already in line at McDonald's. Then it really hits you that you're losing five, that you're missing five dollars. If you lose five dollars in school and you don't really need it, you know, it could, it could completely pass. You, you'll notice it, but you won't dwell on it. If you're in line at McDonald's, you'll dwell on it. If you never even notice it's gone, though, it won't even occur to you to dwell on it. And the same is true about ourselves. When we say things like, we have to, you know, you can't lose yourself. Well, how do you lose yourself? What we really mean is that we lose sight of our values, the things that make us up. So if I were to ask you, who are you? Uh, uh, I don't know. It's a hard question to answer, especially if we've never given it a bunch of thought. And therefore, what that means is that if you haven't given it a bunch of thought about who you are, then you really couldn't possibly lose yourself because you never had yourself to begin with. In other words, if you, if you never had a really strong value, loyalty is important. I've got to be loyal to my friends and family. If that was never your value, then when you're a betrayer, it won't feel like you've lost anything. If, I hope this makes sense. And it's hard to see because it's not something physical. It isn't something that you can hold in your hand like five dollars. And this is why we're going to, we'll, we'll notice the loss of five dollars far quicker than the loss of self. Then there's this interesting thing that happens. If you do recognize yourself, if you do come to an understanding of who you are, then you start to realize that those other things really don't matter as much. Five dollars doesn't really matter. Does money matter? Yes, of course money matters. Anybody who says money doesn't matter either has a lot of it or none of it. Those are the two categories. People who are extremely wealthy and famous will tell you, hey, wealth and fame is not all it's cracked up to be. But then they go do another movie, don't they? Then they go cash in a $21 million paycheck for the movie, don't they? And then they're sitting there in their luxury penthouse, explaining to you, shaking your, their head, saying, man, money, money really does corrupt you. Money is bad for your soul. <laughs> well, then give it away. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you really believe that money is bad for your soul, then you give it away. Or at least you give away enough of it such that it no longer corrupts who you are. But again, first you have to kind of know who you are. And a lot of people just don't know that. And this isn't a slight. Sometimes we see these things posted or we, we talk about it's like, man, you don't even know who you are. Like it's this horrible thing. It's a horrible thing to not know who you are. But not in the sense that a person should feel terrible if you don't know who you are. <clears throat> how much, if you lose $5... Ten dollars. How about twenty? If you lose twenty dollars, how much time do you spend looking for it? A lot more than Long time. How much time have you spent looking for yourself? Yeah. Hopefully a long time. But I imagine that most of us have probably spent more time looking for lost money than we have than we've invested looking for a lost self, or at least trying to discover ourselves. That AirPod bugs me, man. Because that means I had it at some point. And I remember that I, I was at home, and I had them in because I was talking to my friend, and I was doing dishes, and I broke a Coca-Cola glass. I don't know where I got it from. Someone must have given it to me. And the piece of glass got stuck inside of my finger, right there. And I had to get a pair of tweezers, and I was talking to my friend, and I had to get, because uh, it, was, it was jammed in there, I had to get tweezers and pull the glass out, and I did that, it was all bleeding, and it hurt way more than it should have for just a shard of glass. And I was thinking about, uh, you guys seen Squid Games? 
Remember in Squid Games when that girl gets that big old piece of glass stuck in her stomach towards the end? Um, that I, I started thinking about that. I'm like, man, this is a little tiny piece of glass. Imagine how much more that hurt. And I started thinking about how the little pieces of glass may have kind of splintered off from that big piece of glass. So maybe there are little pieces of glass inside of her uh, uh, as well. And man, that must have hurt. So I know I had two AirPods at that time. Because <laughs> so I was remembering all of that. And I remember I put them away. And then I went to the gym. And I went to, and I went to the gym. And I got out of my truck. And I had all, a bunch of stuff in my little like marsupial patch. You know, when you have a hoodie where your, your hands go. And stuff fell out of there, including my little AirPods case. And I remember I went into the gym, and towards the end of class, I looked inside of it because I was going to do something, and I noticed, oh, there's only one. So I went back outside in the street, looked around, and I spent half an hour in the street looking for that stupid thing. God, I figured it had to be there. Could not find it. I even tried the locate your AirPods thing. And the problem is it kept locating my case and telling me that the case was in my pocket. <laughs> So I was walking up and down Highland Duck, dodging traffic, <laughs> before I realized, you idiot, the thing's in your pocket. <laughs> and then somehow, came, and this was about a month ago, well, maybe over a little over a month ago. And then yesterday, I came up in conversation with uh, one of my students who said that they were here on a Saturday school, and they remember seeing one AirPod. And, they, and her and her friend were like, that's weird. Someone left just one AirPod. <laughs> Why didn't you mention it to me? that there was an AirPod just like, floating around in my class. And she's like, well, we, I don't know. We didn't know if it was yours or whose it was. I go, well, you could ask. Like, yeah, we should have done that. So then it gets in my head like, did you really have two AirPods then when you were doing dishes? Did you, leave, did you leave one here on at first Saturday school? And all that starts going in your head. And my goodness, you can see how much time can get spent looking for a replaceable AirPod. You could buy new ones for like 100 bucks. You know, you could buy one for ninety dollars. And how much time has I have I spent looking for things? Way more than a hundred bucks worth of time looking for that one thing. Hope you get my point here. We spend a lot of time looking for replaceable things, and oftentimes we spend very little time looking for the things that are irreplaceable, or at least ensuring that we don't lose the things that are irreplaceable once we discover them. Have I ever told you about Diogenes, the philosopher? One of my favorite philosophers. I think I have. He was the one who, uh, he, was, he, was, he was an ascetic. An ascetic means that he, bless you, means that he does away with all of his worldly possessions. And you might think like, oh my God, why would you do that? Because it wasn't important to him. And you'll see why in just a minute. He was, uh, some of my favorite stories of him were, he was, um, he was in Corinth, the city of Corinth, and there was some, uh, some, some, an army that was invading the city, and everyone's running around and losing their minds because, you know, they, they don't know what to do. So they start doing things like they're boarding up windows, you know, hiding their food, things like that, which are completely useless in the face of an invading army. Because what's the army going to do? They're going to go up to your house and go, oh no, the windows are boarded. Well, we can't go in there. <laughs> We're going to move on. I think that's something we've learned in the past couple of years, that <laughs> the armies don't just move on, they still smash through. And you hide your food, well why? You're not going to have access to it. Wouldn't it make more sense to maybe pack it away and then flee, run away? But the people of Corinth don't do any of that. They run around and they start doing all of this useless stuff. And so Diogenes sees this and he goes, hmm, and he grabs a big vase. He starts rolling this vase up the hill, and as he gets to the top of the hill, Gravity takes over, it slides down, and he runs down, he chases the vase, and he starts rolling it back up, and he starts doing this process over and over again. And the people recognize him as a wise philosopher, so they go to him and they're like, Diogenes, what are you doing? And they figure, whatever he's doing must be a good thing. And Diogenes says, I'm doing the same as you guys, I'm just trying to look, I'm just trying to look busy. And if you understand that, then you understand some things about life, where sometimes the best thing that you can do in life is nothing. But we have this tendency to feel like we have to do something. You know, we have a friend who's, 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 who's sad and it's, you know, something terrible has happened in their lives. And we feel like we have to like cheer them up and do something. But sometimes the best thing that you can do is to just be there. Just be there. Because you don't want a person to, to cover up emotions. I mean, we learned that last semester. Our first several readings were about that. What happens is that you, 
So those things will come back up at some point. So you don't want to cover up your emotions. You want to face them and deal with them. And as Kai said, you can't face them. You can't, you can't face them for somebody. Because you don't know what a person's going through. Yeah. You, can, you can have a sense of it, maybe, because maybe something similar has happened to you. But just like if you and I both go down to the river and we both step into the river, we're not stepping into the same river. Because we're different people and it's different water that's hitting us at different times. No one, and in fact, no, no single person steps into the same river twice. Because the water's changed and you've changed. So whatever it is that you're experiencing is different from what I've experienced, even if we've had the same experience, if that makes sense. So sometimes the best thing that you can do is to just be there for somebody, rather than trying to roll the vase up the hill. And a lot of times in life you'll find this. We don't know what to do. I, was telling, I don't remember if I was telling you guys about this. I was telling some other classes that when I was a little kid, uh, we used to have nuclear, uh, nuclear fallout drills. So you know, we have like earthquake and fire drills. We used to have the, the nuclear fallout drill back then too. And you know what you're supposed to do in case of a nuclear attack? Go under the desk. Exactly. Now you get the idea of what I was talking about with regards to rolling the vase up the hill. We got to lie under the desk. We got to do something, right? We can't just stand there and wait for the wait for the blast, wait for the radiation. We have to do something. No. Sometimes in life there's nothing to do. Sometimes there's nothing to do in life, and so. You can't help, you, you can't find your friend's values for them. You can help them find them. But they've got to be willing to do it. But in all of it, it has to be a willingness to, to find self. And to hold on to self. Because if you lose yourself, you've lost everything. If you've put yourself into that. So an example is going to go back to Diogenes. I told you the story of him meeting Alexander, I think. I told you the story of him... Alexander the Great hears about him, and he's a wise philosopher. So Alexander the Great, who had, by the way, who's conquered most of the known world at his time, he got to, the story goes that he gets to the, the mountains of India, and he stops because he's, he, he hears there's nobody left over there. And he weeps because there's no one left to conquer. And he turns around his army, and they all go to go back home. 30 years old, the guy conquers the world. And it scares me because I wonder how many generations are going to pass before we forget the name of Alexander. Yeah. It puts things into perspective. If, you, if your hope for life is to be remembered long after you're gone, then I would ask you what it is that you're going to do that is greater than conquering the world. Um, like you remember Nebuchadnezzar? You remember Nebuchadnezzar, yes. And who is Nebuchadnezzar? Oh my goodness, you don't know Nebuchadnezzar. My goodness. Of course we don't. There's probably nobody outside of outside of professor, university professors who know who Nebuchadnezzar was. Oh, and fans of the Matrix, by the way, if you if you look it up. But Nebuchadnezzar was a was a Babylonian king who conquered the entire known world of his day. And here we are, only a couple thousand, well, a few thousand years afterwards, we have no idea who Nebuchadnezzar was. And so, if you're living your life to, I'm going to be remembered. What are you going to do that's greater than conquer the entire known world if you're dead? And do you really think that that's going to happen then, that, that you're going to be remembered? Show of hands, how many of you guys know your parents' names? Keep them up. How many of you guys know your grandparents' names? How about your great-grandparents' names? Ooh, great-great-grandparents' names? So, maybe three generations you'll be remembered? <laughs> So maybe if we want to live a meaningful life, there's something deeper than just, I want to be remembered. Maybe there's something else that's there. And so when Alexander goes to Corinth, because he wants to meet Diogenes, Diogenes was called the dog of Corinth. And if you asked him why, he said it's because he was kind to those who fed him, and he bit those who did not. But there's probably more of a reason he was called the dog, uh, the dog of Corinth. He was homeless. He lived in a barrel. A barrel that he found, by the way. He didn't own the barrel. He would poop and pee wherever he was. It didn't matter. He could do it in the marketplace. He would do it in the street. He'd do it in your living room, if you, which he did do. Uh, a nobleman apparently hired him to tutor his son. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> he went to the guy's living room and said, this, I've never crapped in a place so nice. And he was crapped in the guy's living room. And he got fired after that. 
I just, I, I went, what do you think? You're hiring God? How do you think that's going to go? So he, he's in Corinth and he's laying in the street. And Alexander, with all of his retinue, all of his, uh, not his whole army, but all of his, his personal guards and advisors, they all approach Diogenes. And he's just kind of like laying in the street. And Alexander approaches him and asks him, do you know who I am? I'm Alexander. And then Diogenes nods his head and goes, oh yeah, I've heard of you. I know who you are. And Alexander was tutored by Aristotle, who was a philosopher, a very, very well-known philosopher, maybe the greatest to ever live. So he respected philosophers. So he asked Diogenes, well, if you know who I am, then would you allow me a great honor? I want to bless you. And you know who I am. I'm the wealthiest man in the world. I'm the most powerful man in the world. Whatever you want, name it. It's yours. Think about that. Jeff Bezos comes to you and offers you anything you want in the world. What would you ask for? I want the world, Jeff. Can you give me Hawaii? I'll be fine. Can you buy that three or four? I want to fix that thing. No, just give me Hawaii. Even the very thought of having anything you want in the world excites many of us, and it brings us into a good mood. Right before it crashes us, because we realize that we're never going to have that thing. That's an important lesson for life, by the way. Something that the Buddhists have figured out. <laughs> what is it that leads to, 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 to excitement? Well, the attainment of some things. But what leads us down to, to misery and suffering? It's the loss of things. So how do you get rid of suffering? Well, you get rid of your desires. So Diogenes is laying there and he says, Anything I want. Alexander says, Anything you want. You name it, dude. It's yours. And Diogenes says what the equivalent is of, Okay. Well, the, what I want is for you to get the hell out of my sunlight. Because <laughs> they were all standing around him. They are blocking his sunlight. <laughs> he was laying in the sun. So Alexander steps back and starts laughing. And apparently he says to Diogenes, If I were not Alexander of Macedonia, I would want to be Diogenes. Diogenes says, I understand. If I were not Diogenes, I too would want to be Diogenes. <laughs> the point of that story is that this, he says this to the most powerful man in the world. <coughs> if he offends Alexander, what can Alexander take from him? His barrel. His barrel. His barrel. <laughs> ah, take his barrel. No more barrel for you. <laughs> find another barrel. Yeah, go find another barrel. All he could do is take his life, is to kill him. But even then, he's not taking anything that matters. To Diogenes. His life matters to him, but he's not holding on to it with a, with a fist that's so tight that his skin turns you know, white from the loss of blood. He's not holding on to his life like that. Because he understands that even beyond life, there are things that are more important. There's something, there are things that are more important than money. Not just five dollars. There are things that are more important than your body. There's things that are more important than love, even. And that's the self. Because without, if you don't possess the self, you can't possess these things in a way that matters. What's yeah. the self? You're late. Oh. Should have been earlier. That's my way of not asking a question. Did we even talk about that? Yeah. Did I give an answer? Did I, did I give an answer? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It, it's the you. It's the you. When you're driving down the car. <laughs> <laughs> when you're driving. When you're driving down the street. And you're in your car, do I look at your car and say, wow, that's Scruggs? No, that's Scruggs' car. Now, when you crash that car, what do you do? You get out of your car, yes? And you go buy another one, if you have the money. You are not your car. You're the thing that drives your car. You are not your body. You are the thing that drives your body. In other words, there's something deeper, almost mystical, about who, you, who it is that you are. If you lose your arm, are you still you? You lose your other arm, are you still you? We've talked about this. No, you're something else. You're the thing that drives this vehicle. That's the thing you want to not lose. That's your collection of values. It's a collection of psychological states over time, but particularly those psychic things that are important to you, your values, your views. <coughs> Maybe even your connections to other souls. You know, like Aristotle said, what's a, what's, a, what's a friend? It's a single soul that dwells in two bodies. Maybe it's that connection. 
And so the point is that when you're like Diogenes, you can't take anything from that guy. You, know? you can't take anything from him that matters. All you can do is, is try to force him to live contrary to his values, which he will never do. You can torture him, and he'll hang out as long as he can. But even if you force him that way, he, as soon as you stop, he goes right back to what he was. In other words, it's only to, to make the torture stop. You can't take, you know, take his barrel. <laughs> you know, all you could do from him was take away his sunlight. So, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques?